This is Season 2 of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a podcast about Japanese sci-fi mega-franchise Mobile Suit Gundam for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, where we watch, analyze, and review all 40 years of the iconic anime in the order it was made. We research its influences, examine its themes, and discuss how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. This is episode 2.46, The Hammer of Xeon, and we're your hosts. I'm Tom, a lifelong Gundam fan, and I am not Tom Asnable from Twitter, but no, you are not the first person to think so. And I'm Nina, new to Zeta, and I'll never be the podcaster I want to be unless I can get over this hurdle. Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 309 patrons and subscribers. Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our newest supporter, Christian C. MSB would not be possible without your support. We don't have much in the way of special updates from New York this week. Just one strong admonition. Wear a face mask! Be like Char. Hide your face. But the opposite half of your face. <laughs> Covering your eyes won't help. This week we are covering Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam episode 45, From the Heavens. After the recap and our talkback, we have research on the inspiration behind the name Gate of Zidan, and what it means about the Titans, Axis, and Ayug. But first, let's tune in to the Titans News Network. Hello, TNN Premium subscriber, and welcome to your Platinum Tier All Access virtual tour of the newly completed TNN Studio offices located here in the Gate of Zedan. I'm your host and three-time winner of the Howitzer Prize for Propaganda, Lieutenant Commander Nina Nina's daughter. Tom Thompson is out again today, missing and presumed dead after a failed attempt to break into the Axis Zeon throne room while captive aboard the Guadan. He risked it all for an exclusive interview with misbegotten space tyrant Minerva Zabi. Journalism is poorer for his absence. May he be remembered for his televised funeral's impressive ratings. The Gate of Zidane is the ideal location for the new TNN studio offices. From this orbital position, our powerful array of broadcast antennae can penetrate every region in the Earth sphere, smothering the rebellious colonies with our powerful and irresistible message of truth, now and forever. And don't worry, TNN stars like myself won't be suffering either. We've taken over the regally appointed chambers previously occupied by top executives at News Broadcasting Zionic, back when the Gate of Zedan was known as Zion Space Fortress Abawaku. These NBZ apartments were crammed full of antiques, famous artwork, expensive vases, vintage wines, and much more. Enough to make even the famed luxuries of the TNN Tower in New York seem downright austere by comparison. Why in my room, I myself found two antique rapiers. They were broken and covered with blood, but later on, I'll show you how I repurposed them as chic curtain rods. In order to avoid another intern uprising, TNN has revamped its employment policies and commitment to an exciting new program which we are calling Ethics in Hiring for Journalism. We will no longer abuse legal loopholes to exploit unpaid, desperate laborers. Therefore, our offices here at the Gate of Zedan are now staffed by independent contractors hired through popular gig employment app, Frududur. Here's your coffee, Lieutenant Commander. And please don't forget to give me five stars so that I don't get corrected. <laughs> we'll see. Hmm, this tastes like four and a half star coffee to me. The new TNN offices mark the beginning of a glorious new era for TNN, and therefore the Titans. Though we appreciate everything those who came before us have accomplished, it is time to leave the comfort of our nest. Esconced within the impregnable walls of the mightiest space fortress imaginable, and with the unwavering support of my new advisor, Paptimus Sirocco, the time has come for us to leave Tom Thompson and the old ways of Earth behind as we stride boldly forward into the future under a new leader. A woman leader. 
me. A new era calls for a new slogan as we define your new reality. The official announcement won't take place until after His Excellency Jemitov Hyman's upcoming negotiations with Haman Karn. But since you're a platinum tier subscriber, I'll give you a little sneak peek. Are you ready? TNN Astra. Beyond Earth. Forever. And now the recap for From the Heavens. The Gate of Zedan's control room is a frantic hum of activity as they launch as many ships as possible, as quickly as possible. They have only one hour until Axis will strike, and in that time, must save as much of their staff and supplies and as many of their ships as they can. But Ayug will not sit back while this happens. They are closing in to keep the Titan's fleet from escaping, in a strategy Appley calls whack-a-mole. Sirocco plans to keep the Jupitress well clear of the fighting, but sees an opportunity in the inevitable chaos of battle. Rekoa will use the confusion as cover and rescue Sarah from the Argama. With some jealousy and wary of encountering her old crewmates, Rekoa pushes back, asking if he insists that she go. Calmly, he explains that Sarah may have gathered valuable information since her capture, and that if the positions were reversed, he would send Sarah to rescue her. He orders Rekoa to launch in the Palace Athene mobile suit, after which the Jupitress leaves the area. Alone in a dark room, Katz watches the live security footage of Sarah's cell. Camille and Fa rush in looking for him. He completely missed the mission briefing and Emma is furious. It's time to launch, and Camille grabs hold of Katz's arm only for Katz to pull sharply away. Camille slaps him, leaving both Fa and Katz stunned. How can you tell me to fight when I feel this way? I know you understand, Katz rails, but Camille is steely. Can't Katz see what is going on around them? He needs to get his head on straight, put Sarah out of his mind, and focus on the fight ahead of them, or he'll be the one who dies. Fine, I'll fight, Katz grumbles and leaves in a huff. As they all get into their mobile suits, Camille thinks to himself that Katz will never be a truly great pilot unless he learns to master his own emotions. The Ayug forces fire on the Gate of Zedan and the fleeing Titan's ships, with the Gate of Zedan firing back, and soon the space around them is an impenetrable net of laser fire. While the Titans continue their desperate push to get materials and ships out of Zedan, Ayug and Haman's forces block the spaceport exits. Smiling, Haman observes the battle from the bridge of the Guadan, pleased with their progress. Deep inside the ship, sheltered and ignorant of the dangers outside, Minerva takes a violin lesson with her tutor. Taking a deep breath, Rekawa makes the plunge, weaving her way in close to the Argama. The spotters and the gunners miss her, and she has a clear shot at the rear of the ship. Yet she hesitates. When she fires, the damage is disruptive but not catastrophic. Just enough for Sarah to escape through the smoke back to her mobile suit and out into space. She thinks of Katz, wishing she could have seen him one last time, and he senses her across the battlefield. He takes off after her, heedless of the risk, and Emma follows, yelling at him to watch out for friendly fire. It is clear that Katz and Sarah do not want to kill each other, but Sarah feels trapped, as if it is already too late for her. When Katz tries to talk her around and tells her that he just wants to be with her, she accuses him of being unmanly for expressing his feelings so openly. His face looks just like it did when Camille slapped him. Once Emma catches up, she fires on Sarah and urges Katz to do the same, but he can't do it. Sarah escapes back to the Jupitress. In the meantime, Fa clashes with the mobile suit that fired on the Argama, not realizing that Rekoa is the pilot until Rekoa says to her, You've improved, Fa. 
Mission accomplished, Rekawa retreats, but Fa chases her, grabbing hold of the Palace Athane and flying straight at the Gate of Zidane. Fa, let me go! Rekawa cries out, firing at the Titan's mobile suits in their path so that her own suit won't be destroyed. They crash down a hangar and leave their mobile suits to talk face to face. Fa can't understand why Rekawa would betray them, and although Rekawa tries to dodge the accusation, talking about how she finally feels affection again, how she is content and stable for the first time, Fa is unmoved. Rekawa's selfishness has hurt them all, but especially Camille. Rekawa credits Camille's feelings with him being a man, and muses that behaving according to gender is simple. It's ideology that's complicated. And besides, the men of the Argama thought only of themselves. Confused by this little speech, and uncertain what gender has to do with any of this, Fa looks on, until an explosion in the hangar knocks them back. Camille arrives in the Zeta, and when Rekua retreats to her mobile suit, Fa draws her pistol and takes aim, but cannot bring herself to shoot. Just outside, Jared is defending the gate of Zedan, and he spots Camille chasing Rekua. He is eager to take on his rival and yells at Rekua to get out of the way, but she grabs hold of the Zeta instead. Willing to kill one of his own allies if it means destroying the Zeta Gundam, Jared is taking aim when Fa tackles him. Apoli calls out to her and sends Body to help the Zeta. Rekua shoots a leg off Body's Rick Diaz. Jared and Fa disentangle, and Apoli dives between them, just as Jared shoots. Apoli dies, saving Fa, the direct hit completely destroying his mobile suit, and him with it. In a rage, Camille slashes at Jared's Bjarland, and even Jared is surprised by the true power of the Zeta. Jared retreats back after Camille's attacks cut through one of the Bjarland's thrusters. Axis will hit in three minutes, and it is time for the Argama and all the rest of the Ayug and Axis forces to go. Every vessel leaves the area as fast as they can. Several ships and mobile suits that are not fast enough, agile enough, or lucky enough are destroyed by the debris that shatters off when the massive bases collide. Even now, Jared and Camille still dogfight through the pandemonium until Shar calls Camille back to the Argama. All of the power of Axis is now in the Earth Sphere, and Melanie Hugh Carbine is coming to negotiate with Haman directly. But the younger pilots of the Argama are not thinking of politics just now. They sit quietly in small groups, grieving Apoli. Fa blames herself for not killing Rekawa when she had a chance. And although Emma credits Fa's kindness, Fa can't help but wonder if it's something else. Rekawa has accepted her fate. Isn't that what being a woman is? Emma disagrees, and they both fall silent, deep in their own thoughts. From the very beginning of this episode, there's a feeling of inevitability and of futility, which infuses the whole episode. Inevitability, of course, embodied in the asteroid axis, which is so huge that once set on its course, there's really no stopping it. There's nothing the Titans can do. They don't even consider the possibility of stopping or diverting or destroying axis. Once it's been launched at them, the collision between Axis and the Gate of Zidane is inevitable, and it's only a matter of time. As for the feeling of futility, that I think is, you know, the other side of the coin from inevitability. Once we know that Axis is going to hit Zidane and nothing can be done about it, then everything else falling in the shadow of that feels a little futile. But more particularly, in this episode, we see a great triumph for the Ayug Axis Alliance. On the grand scale, they do destroy the Gate of Zidane, they force the Titans into retreat, they capture a bunch of Titans' ships, all huge victory stuff for Ayug and Axis. 
But for all of our individual characters, this is an episode of, of failures and frustrations and uh, futile attempts to overcome what is beginning to feel like destiny. I would argue that even on the grander scale, that same inevitability and futility comes into play. At the end of the episode, Bright seems to notice in a resigned kind of way that, oh, and now the entirety of Axis's firepower is in the Earth sphere, and we invited them. Yes. Bright is aware there at the end that a conflict between Ayug and Axis feels inevitable. Well, and that there wasn't anything he could do to avoid this outcome. He had to ally with Axis. They really didn't have another option. Axis had to bring all their ships here. Again, they did not have another option. And yet, <laughs> yeah, this is very not ideal. It's like these huge planetary bodies being brought into collision courses by their orbits, things that can't really be changed by the individual efforts of human beings. Although there is a hint in there that Axis's position is, in many ways, thanks to clever planning on Haman's part. But clearly most of our characters feel as though they are at the whims of fate to mm -hmm. some degree or other. Well, and not so very long ago, Jamatov Hyman and Basque felt as though they were the puppet masters orchestrating everything. They were in control of the situation, and it was that Basque could, at a moment's notice, whenever he chose to act, crush Ayug with one hand. Uh, and now they are fleeing in disarray. There's a beautiful shot from the end of the episode that works as a sort of visual metaphor for these massive forces. We have the Gate of Zedan on one side, we have Axis on the other, both heavily damaged, the massive debris field that's been created by their collision, and between the two and through the haze of debris, we have the Earth. Throughout much of Zeta, there has been a tendency among the characters and with us watching the show to equate the Titans and Earth and the Titans and Earthnoids. But what this visual hammers home is that, in fact, the Earth is this conceptual prize hung between warring factions, that the Earth exists as this separate entity from these political interests. And it is, in fact, what is being fought over, and Earth as a more abstract thing, not Earth as place where Earth people live, not Earth as a shorthand for Earth people, but the Earth. I also realized as you were talking about the various characters and their response to the sense of being at the mercy of fate, being in situations that they cannot control, is that a big part of how I felt about characters in this episode had to do with how they reacted to that. Many of the times I felt most angry, <laughs> it was because <laughs> a character was using that lack of control over things around them to abdicate responsibility for their own behavior. Huh, who who was doing that? Hmm. <laughs> it's more than one person, so. Yeah, uh, that's true it's and kind, fair. It's kind of a theme in the episode, you know, which characters do that and which characters don't. And if they did that, I probably got very angry with them in this episode, and if they don't, I didn't. <laughs> for once. And then not for once. I am I am frequently very pleased with Camille. I'm very pleased with Camille here. I wonder if Camille is very pleased with himself here. No, I think Camille is probably sad, but I think Camille is very sad. Not just because of the things that happen in the episode, but because of what Camille himself is is becoming and is doing. Maybe he has the perspective and the emotional wherewithal to feel okay about it, but that moment when Camille hits cats in the beginning of the episode. This is when Camille and Fa notice that Katz is not at the meeting. Emma is super mad. They go to find him, and they find him in the security station watching Sarah through a security monitor. A completely futile and kind of creepy activity. Yep. Absolutely both of those things. Uh, and when they try to talk to him, Katz won't hear it, and Camille hits him. This is a very unusual action for Camille. He hasn't done this before. Everyone but Camille looks shocked. Fa looks shocked. Katz, Katz looks far more shocked than hurt. Many times that we've seen Camille get hit, it's clear that he's been hit very hard and he's in pain. 
cats get slapped by Camille, and it's not clear that it was more... I mean, obviously, a, a slap is a slap, right? But it doesn't look like he hit cats particularly hard. It looks like it was more of a, like, hey, wake up. <laughs> you're going to bleep me. Oh, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're right. This is a slap to get cats' attention. And I think it's coming from a place for Camille. They've just mentioned how angry Emma is. This is Camille trying to set cats straight so that cats doesn't get hurt very badly by somebody higher up the command chain the way Camille has been. But even more essentially, I think Camille, so this is a bit complex, but I had a, a realization during this episode. What Camille is really talking about here is mastery of your emotions. And at a lot of times and places, this is equated with adulthood, though many adults don't have particularly good <laughs> mastery of their emotions. But there are a lot of activities where we're sort of coached from a very young age that in order to be good at X, you need to be able to control your feelings. For a lot of sports, that's necessary because if the game goes badly or if you mess up, you can't afford to go to pieces in you know business negotiations, in politics. It's not that you can never be emotional or express emotion, but you need to be using your emotion as a tool. You can't let your emotion control you. You can't get tilted to use the term from competitive video games. Yeah, and I think this episode, not just in that beginning portion, but throughout, especially at the end, confirms what you're saying. To be a good mobile suit pilot, to be a good soldier, you do have to be able to control your emotions. Like at the end, when Camille and Jared are fighting in the debris field and Quattro is like, Camille, we need to go, leave that guy. Camille is like, yeah, okay. I can put my emotions, which are incredibly strong, off to the side and do what I need to do right now to survive. And at the same time, when he unleashes his anger on Jared, Jared is shocked by the power of the Zeta. The yes. use of that anger in a constructive way is very powerful. And Camille tells Katz, if you can't stop thinking about her, you're the one who's going to die. It goes beyond one of the higher ups is going to beat you. Camille, again, hates the idea of pointless death. He does not want a distracted and confused cats out on the battlefield to wind up dead. And Camille, of course, has a lot of personal experience with this exact problem. Camille has spent most of his time on the show not being in control of his emotions and nearly getting killed because of it. He's been lucky and he's been helped. But cats can't be sure that he's going to get the benefit of either of those. What I think we have to do here, though, is look back on those previous instances of violence, especially violence that's been dealt out to Camille by his commanding officers, by Wong Li, by Emma, by everybody. And we can sort of divide it into two categories. There is the, let's call it well-meaning violence, designed to wake him up and try to force him to learn to control his emotions. The same thing Camille is doing to cats here. And then there's a different kind of violence, which may look the same from the outside, but is actually very different because it's designed to reinforce the hierarchy. It's not wake up, it's shut up. Shut up and do what you're told. It's about enforcing obedience, not enforcing habits that will keep him alive. And this attitude towards these two different kinds of violence can be seen in other aspects of the show because it's too simplistic to say that these are anti-war media. Gundam as a, as a whole, or First Gundam, or Zeta Gundam, because they do evince a certain uh, belief that some war is necessary. Some fights need to be fought. The Titans need to be opposed, even though the collateral damage from that will be huge and horrendous. Related to those two different kinds of interpersonal violence you identified within these organizations, I have a note here about Rekua and Sirocco and Basque. Hmm. I was clearly wrong last episode. There is obviously some jealousy on Rekua's <laughs> side because she questions being sent to go rescue Sarah, which ought to immediately make you remember the time she questioned the gas attack that Basque was sending her on. And when she did this to Basque, he walked around his desk and he punched her in the face so hard that he knocked her back. She doubled over. When she questions Sirocco's orders, he explains to her, I'm sure Sarah has very valuable information from being inside the ship and I want it. 
Also, if the positions were reversed, I would, of course, send her to rescue you. Yes, you have to go do it. And how, in a twisted way, although we know Sirocco uses threats of violence, although we know he's deeply manipulative, the absence of punitive violence makes him seem like a good guy compared to this other recent experience of Rekawa's. You mean the recent experience of Rekawa's that he ordered her to go experience? <laughs> yes, indeed. Huh. I wonder if Sirocco knew that that would happen, since Basque is nothing if not predictable. Rekawa is another person who I got very strong <laughs> abdicating responsibility for my actions vibes. Oh, she is the worst one. Because when she gets confronted, she doesn't try to explain herself. She goes off on this diatribe about the ways of the world. Like, in this world, there are only... Nim, 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 nim. Well, I, I found her dodge incredibly cowardly. Foss says, how could you betray us? And she basically tries to say, well, because I'm not ideological, I didn't actually betray you. <laughs> From my point of view, Ayug are the traitors, or whatever. Or, you know, I only owe allegiance and responsibility to myself, therefore I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. One thing she mentions, which we have not researched, she couches it in her very flowery romantic language, blech, but she says that she has basically felt really, like, blunted emotions since the first war. She doesn't feel emotion as strongly, she doesn't feel, like, love and attachment as strongly, that sounds like a classic trauma response. Yes, it does. And while we haven't researched that specifically, the thing she says about craving stability, mm -hmm. and she talks about how now that she's with Sirocco, she feels content and she feels stable. I did notice that. One of the symptoms of PTSD can be uh, that you never feel stable and you never feel content or safe. It's really difficult to think about the future uh, because the present always feels tenuous. Fa accuses her of being selfish. Does she even we'll, respond to that? Sort of. We'll dig into the gender stuff separately. <laughs> oh, God, the gender stuff. The gender stuff's real bad. But she complains that the men on the Argama thought only of themselves, which is a weird complaint, given that that's exactly what she's doing. It also, and I've mentioned this before, places the entire responsibility for fixing her emotional problems on other people. One of those men was supposed to fall in love with me and make me love him, <laughs> and then I would be fine. And I like that Fa doesn't actually get what Rekoa is arguing, because Rekoa's argument isn't a real argument. But Fa's response to this is like, wait, are you talking about Quattro, or like, what are you saying? And Rekoa just bulldozes on to the next talking point. Yeah. Well, and because Fa knew that there was maybe something between Rekoa and Quattro, but... Rekwa can't possibly mean all of the men aboard the Argama. That wouldn't make any sense. She didn't try to romance every man on the Argama. Yeah. Although it calls into question the times that she was particularly attentive to Bright. I'm like, oh, was she trying to <laughs> maybe see if something was going to happen there? But then Ooh. why wasn't she interested in Camille when he was clearly interested in her? Because Camille's too young. Yeah, in this conversation, uh, it really seems like... Fa is trying to meet Rekoa halfway. Fa is actually trying to understand what Rekoa is saying, but then Rekoa doesn't really understand herself, or she's not arguing in good faith. It's very similar to when Camille first encountered Rekoa after Rekoa left. He wanted to understand why. And for Fa, much of the reason that she wants to understand is because she's seen how this has hurt Camille. Fa wants closure at this point. I don't think at any point in there Fa thought Rekoa was going to come back with her. I think she also just wants, she wants to confront Rekawa with the emotional damage that she's caused. Mm -hmm. And then Rekawa somehow makes Camille's being hurt about his being a man, which... Hey, like, you said we'd keep the gender stuff for later. I know. And it's all tangled up in there. <laughs> it's like they just took a bucket full of weird gender stuff and just poured it all over this episode. It's not weird. It's highly reductionist. You're right. Weird was the wrong word. Which bad, means it's bad wrong. Bad gender stuff. <laughs> it's bad and it's wrong. All right. So they took a big bucket full of bad, wrong gender stuff and they just poured it all over the episode. The episode is like a layer cake. <laughs> futility, inevitability, futility, inevitability, and then bad, wrong, gender stuff icing. To save that for later, though, and to go <laughs> back to Rekwa doesn't understand herself. She's running from Camille. Jared appears. Jared's going to go after Camille. She says, oh, I'll back you up. And he's like, no, get out of my way. <laughs> and she takes off after Camille. 
why would she do this? She catches Camille in a hug and she's like, I told you the next time we met, we'd meet his enemies. But by entangling herself with him, with anybody other than Jared, this would potentially save Camille <laughs> from being shot at by other Titans mobile suits. Yeah, Rekka was still clearly... Protecting completed. Camille. Yeah. Well, and she hesitates to shoot the Arkama. She does eventually do it, but she does hesitate. Of course, Jared is like, fine, I'll just kill both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting, though, that Jared's rivalry is such that he's not really concerned about killing another Titan's pilot if it means he can kill Camille. You'll notice earlier, Rekua blasted two Titans pilots to avoid crashing into them. But I think that was very specifically her or them. Like if, if Fa had crashed her into those other pilots, Rekua might have died. Mm -hmm. Probably. Jared could probably just leave Rekua and Camille to fight and it wouldn't get him killed. But it's absolutely significant that Rekua does not hesitate about shooting them. Oh, yeah. No remorse, no compunctions, no hesitation. Whereas she seems deeply uncomfortable with the fact that she has to go attack the Argama. Props to Fa, whose initial instinct is to try to shoot Rekua. She does have some second thoughts and she doesn't actually pull the trigger, but her natural response when Rekua is leaving is to pull out her gun. Well, and she gives Rekua a heck of a fight. Oh yeah, Fa is <laughs> great in this episode. Up against a vastly superior mobile suit too. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and sort of the brilliance of tackling her and being mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm going to crash you into the gate of Zedon <laughs> then. Lots of determination and fearlessness from Fa in this episode. Before we get into the gender stuff, two more notes on people who have sort of resigned themselves to fate. Katz, when he is complaining about how can you expect me to fight like this before Camille slaps him, is basically saying... I can't control my feelings. Even though Sarah betrayed me, I still love her. And all my mixed up feelings mean that I cannot possibly go out and fight Titans. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you be angrier at the Titans? The Titans are the ones who did this to her. Anyway. And then Sarah, who at the ripe old age of 15, <laughs> says, it's too late for me, cats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 15, and I have a boyfriend. He's a much older man, and we're going to be together forever. Teenagers hate when adults get smug, and I remember that. And I think that's why it's generally better for adults to say nothing <laughs> about these sort of situations. But wow, the yeah. teens, the teens. The teens are not okay. Sarah is such a mess, which is appropriate since she's been set up as a mirror image for Rekua. Even the moment when she says, Cats, you're nice, but I met Sirocco first. So what? That means you can't ever question your own actions or grow or evolve as a person? Shades of Lala there, right? When Lala and Amuro had their communion in First Gundam, and Lala was like, I like you, but I met Char first. Sorry. Because women are obviously like baby birds, and once they've imprinted on someone, that's it. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I think you made that joke about a year ago when we were talking about Lala, too. Probably. It was as appropriate then as it is now. More so because of the bird symbolism. That's true. However, I love that when Sarah says, I met Sirocco first, Katz actually responds by saying, that's not an excuse. And Sarah is like, oh, is it not? Well, okay, then I guess you'd better just kill me. I'm a loser, baby, so why don't you kill me? <laughs> But he uh, doesn't. You can almost hear Katz go, ugh, and roll his eyes when Emma arrives, even though it's very clear that his conversation with Sarah is completely pointless and not going anywhere. Yep. Ugh, I can't keep engaging in this futile conversation now that Senpai is here. <laughs> She's going to want me to kill you. <laughs> you want me to kill you? Why does everybody want me to kill you? Shoot her. Shoot her. Indeed. Total sidebar for a moment, but I do enjoy that the episode feels the need to explain why Rosamia and Gates do not make an appearance. But they haven't been in the show for episodes. But it, it does seem weird mm -hmm. that you would have these important, powerful pilots who don't launch during such a significant fight. However, it would needlessly muddy up the episode to have Camille dealing with 
so many complicated relationships all at once. If he had to deal with Rosamia stuff and Rekoa stuff in the same episode, oh my gosh, like how do you even make right. that happen in a way that makes sense? This is one of Zeta's problems. Too many characters, many of whom fulfill the same roles. Too many characters, too many significant relationships, to the point where you're having to justify why you're leaving some of them out because it would just become too complicated <laughs> to include them all. Can you imagine how stupidly complicated <laughs> yes. this episode yeah, would I, be? God, yes, I agree. And they wouldn't be able to spend as much time on the Rekua and Sarah stories. And so it would also in some ways remove Camille's point of superiority because if he is behaving with Rosamia the way Katz is behaving with Sarah, then he no longer has the sort of high ground and experience to be like, Katz, yeah. you need to be better. Last episode, you mentioned the aesthetics of Zeta and how it harkens back to the 1800s, actually. Mm -hmm. This is the first thing I thought of when I noticed Hymum's ruffly cuffs on his shirt. Yes. It's a tiny thing. He lifts a hand up to his face and you can see just uh, a tiny bit longer than his jacket. There's a sort of ruffled cuff visible. He's so fancy. And you get that from Mineva's violin recital as well, or practice, I guess, because she's in this grand palatial room. She's a seven, eight-year-old, but she's being waited on by, I assume, a music teacher, a bunch of maids, various servants and guards. There may have been a production reason for this, but I like to think it was not simply saving money. <laughs> We go from Haman, who's very satisfied with how the fighting is going, to these shots of Minerva. And the shots of Minerva are not animated. They're painted panels that are sort of tracked across and zoomed in on while this classical music is playing. And the way these panels are painted is very lovely, but it really hammers home, in case we didn't realize already, Minerva's position as a figurehead who, as much as possible, is being kept isolated and removed from the reality of governing axis of the political situation. They're in the middle of a huge and significant battle and she's having a violin lesson. The change in the art style, switching to that painted style, reinforces that separation. That she lives in this rarefied, beautiful world that is isolated from danger, from sort of more serious worldly concerns. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. That's a different thing. <laughs> everything was beautiful and nothing was about gender. Good God. But actually everything is about gender in this episode. Ugh. Let's talk about the gender. Ugh. Ugh. So the first wrong thing that Rekoa says is that there are two genders, that everyone is either a man or a woman. When in fact there are two genders, Gundams and Methuses. <laughs> when in fact there is infinite gender. Gender is a construct. <laughs> Again, this is Rekua not wanting to take responsibility for herself or her actions. There's something very childish about her going, well, in all the world, everyone is a man or a woman, which tells me things about them and makes them understandable to me. Unlike ideologies, like that's nothing like ideologies with the implication that ideologies are infinite and complicated and she doesn't want to deal with them. She's like, I disengage myself from that whole discussion. It's a little bit like when people say, oh, I don't, I don't do politics. Mm -hmm. In Rekua's very binary and constrictive notion of gender, because she is a woman, there are certain things she has to do, certain ways she has to behave, certain ways she's allowed to feel. There's a script for her to follow. And so she doesn't have to take responsibility for anything she does because she's merely following the script and she doesn't have any choices. Which may also explain her focus on putting blame on the men of the Argama, because in her construction of what it means to be a woman, she's meant to be passive. Men are supposed to approach her. And because they failed to fulfill their gender role, her leaving them, her abandoning the Argama is the natural consequence of that failure. She just had to go and find somebody who would fulfill their duty. And here we do see again the connection to Sarah, the other side of the mirror, where Sarah is talking to Katz and says, obviously I appreciate that you're in love with me, but it is incredibly unmanly of you to express your feelings and therefore I can never love you back. This is tied to the moment where he puts even the littlest hint of blame on her for her actions. When she says, well, I met Sirocco first, and he says, that's not an excuse for your behavior. She says, well, then I guess you'd better kill me. 
we're in ideologically opposed positions and you blame me and so it's unresolvable and you'd better kill me when his very natural response is i don't want to kill you i want to talk to you i want to see you Ugh! how can you just say your feelings like that gross <laughs> And the expression on his face when she tells him that she cannot love him is exactly the same as when Camille slapped him. Shocked dismay. Stunned horror. You know, he understands that Sarah is young and that Sarah is being manipulated by Sirocco. And he is in a very difficult position, I agree. You know, we, we do not hold children accountable for their actions in the same way that we do adults. Yeah, Sarah has been brainwashed. Sarah needs to be deprogrammed if it can be done safely. And I don't have an answer to this question, but what do you do if a, if a kid is pointing a gun at you? If you have a gun and a kid has a gun and that kid is probably going to shoot you, what do you do? I, like, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Like, it's an impossible situation. Yeah. You know, there are standard operating procedures. There are rules for how you handle the situation like that built into the rules of engagement. And for soldiers, that is essential because that takes some of the responsibility off of them. Well, because then you're not making a decision. It's not that you have to make a decision in a moment. It's that you just have to react in the way that you have been told you're supposed to. It seems very likely that that is part of where Emma's decisiveness comes from that Emma does not see a child. Emma sees an enemy soldier, an enemy combatant, and that's it. The mobile suit elides the difference between an adult and a child. Because in the mobile suit, Sarah becomes the Bolinok Saman. She's not herself a 15-year-old girl. She is a weapon of war. A weapon of war with very decided opinions on what constitutes manliness <laughs> for someone so young. Weird how everybody in Sirocco's orbit has developed these uh, really stultified, restrictive, toxic ideas about gender. And even that is a ruse because we have seen Sirocco just lay out his feelings in words to Rekoa because he knew with Rekoa that would work. He's much more distant with Sarah. With Sarah, it's much more about a hand on the shoulder or an embrace. It's not about words. And he uses the jealousy, he uses his clear closeness with Rekoa because that motivates Sarah. Rekoa needs to be motivated differently. It occurs to me now thinking about it, when we first saw Sirocco interacting with other Titans characters, it was when he was overseeing Jared and Moar, and we could see, we could tell that he was trying to bring Moar into his orbit. And his behavior with her was much more straightforward than we've seen him with either Sarah or Rekua. It didn't work, but Moar ended up falling in love with Jared, who is incredibly straightforward. Sirocco seems to have a sense for what people are looking for, and then he can contort himself into an approximation of that shape. He even does the same thing with Yazan, not in a romantic way. Though it's unclear if what he's doing with Rekua or Sarah is romantic from his perspective. Well, but he recognizes it's a romantic manipulation, at the very least in Rekua's case. But with Yazan as well, he knows what Yazan will respond to in a personality for a commander, and he emulates that. Something that comes up frequently in our discussions of gender in Gundam is... Which characters are right? Which characters are wrong? Is there a message we're supposed to take away? Is there an opinion here that's being espoused by the writers? Is there something that's being elevated as correct or something that's being circled as incorrect? I should note, by the way, as long as we're talking about the writers, that this is an episode written by Endo, who is the writer who is responsible for most of the episodes in which there are extensive discourses about gender. While I do not think that Rekua is being held up as correct, I do think it's complicated. Because if you look at the structure of the second to last scene, where everyone's grieving Apoli, look at the groupings. 
The women are sitting together. The men are sitting together. The children are sitting together. And each of these groups is distinct and apart from the others. They are not all together. When Fa blames herself for Apolli's death because she couldn't bring herself to shoot Rekawa, Emma first says, you know, because you're kind. And it's clear she doesn't really mean this as a compliment, more a weakness. It says, like, you want to let Rekawa choose her path. And Fa says, no, I, I can't be kind in that way. Which we saw when she confronted Rekawa, it wasn't like, I respect your right to choose what to do with your life. It was like, no, you're... <laughs> you're bad and I want you to feel bad. Yeah. In the English subtitles, she says it's that she's living the life of a woman, or I think she's living the life of a woman, which I want to dig into that translation because it's complicated. Please do. But Emma's response is, no, nah, I don't think that's it. Yes. <laughs> Emma, noted woman who has a lot in common with Rekoa, is like, nah, that is absolutely not what's going on here. But we know that Emma does not prioritize the same things that Rekoa prioritizes. Rekoa thinks a great love will fix her. Emma, not in a hurry to date anybody. Not at all concerned about whether or not she will even have children, much less when. You know, Emma is a modern career woman. Well, and I love the positioning of Fa here as a younger, inexperienced, not entirely certain, taking her first steps into the world as an adult woman. And so Fa's sort of listening to what people are telling her and trying to figure out an answer. And so she comes back from this confrontation with Rekoa and she has an answer, Rekoa's answer, which she sort of lays out and Emma rejects. The body language in this scene is so good. You know, Camille can't possibly not be hearing them. He might not be listening attentively to their conversation, but he's sitting with his back to the same couch that they're sitting on, with one arm sort of slung over and staring off into the distance. Emma looks at Fa, but Fa is sort of staring at the ceiling. She has her head tilted back on the couch, and she's just kind of staring up, talking into the ether. Uh, we had some difficulty listening to the Japanese. But what we're fairly certain she said was onate amanjinai ka to omottari surun desu. Which is a bit like to be a woman is to accept your fate, isn't it? I think. Amanjiru, the verb there, means to accept your fate, to embrace, to sort of like what happens to you. Again, focusing on this sort of passive movement through the world that things will happen to you and you have to accept them. And that that is what being a woman is. And when you think of the line that way, Emma's total rejection of it, like, no, that is not it, makes so much more sense. Emma is so active. Emma really believes at a foundational level and everything she's done has reinforced this, that she is in control of her own life. Her actions matter and the consequences are her responsibility. She rejects Sarah's position that you cannot change by leaving the Titans, which is where she started out. She rejects Rekawa's dependence on other people. She rejects Rekawa's desperate need for a man to make her feel complete. Ugh, trust the show to do some stuff to make me like Emma, who is usually so <laughs> terrible. Emma has many good qualities. The show will never let me completely dislike or completely like anyone, except for Apoli, and now he's gone. Yes, Apoli, like the single best, most consistently <laughs> good. Just like decent dude. Just a reliably good human being. He's kind to Camille and to Fa. This one hits you hard. I remember watching it with you the first time. You can feel it about to happen. And that really is part of what I was thinking of when I was talking about the sense of inevitability and futility that's baked into this episode. You can feel that it's going to happen almost from the moment the Rick Diaz and the Byerlant first connect. I was going to say from the moment that he rushes in and says, Fa, get back. Yeah. Fa is trying to protect Camille from Jared. <laughs> Apple is trying to protect Fa. Camille is trying to get Rekawa still. It's complicated. There's a lot of stuff happening. Bati is in there too. It's one after another after another of these quick interactions and quick shifts of an attack, a defense, 
a third person. It's a frantic, chaotic battle. First Camille is in danger, then Fa is in danger, then Body is in danger, and then Apolli. And it slows down. Everything is chaos and frantic energy, and then it slows down, and the beam is so slow when it hits Apolli's Rictias. I had an intense anger at the quote-unquote adults moment. I can't help but think of First Gundam and the deaths of significant characters in First Gundam and how those deaths were treated. Ryu's feels like the most apt parallel. Apolli was kind of the Ryu of Zeta. But even remembering Matilda and, you know, that these moments were treated with grief and expression of emotion. I mean, even the death of Watkin, a character who showed up in like three episodes. There's a moment of reverence. We see what's done there. And so to have Apolli's death pass with Quattro saying, oh, Apolli died in battle, Bright saying he was a good pilot, and a bunch of younger people silently grieving by themselves in the break room feels so completely inadequate. Yes. And like a real failure of leadership. Totally agreed. Also, for Quattro, Char, Apolli has been his wingman at least his like friend and associate and accomplice, since the One Year War. They fought together in the One Year War. At this point, Apolli is probably the closest thing to a friend that Char has ever had. Except maybe Garma. And definitely the longest surviving of Char's wingmen. So for Char to have basically no reaction to Apolli's death is just, that sucks, buddy. That sucks. He was more upset about bowing to Minerva. And all of that is even more infuriating and depressing when you remember that Apolli has had the strongest emotional reaction to the deaths of his wingmen, to the death of Roberto, to the death of uh, Lieutenant Batch a few episodes ago. Like, Apolli cares about his pilots. Apolli has grieved and mourned on screen in public. The whole Argama is unworthy of Apolli. That's what I'm saying. But I don't want to end on that tragic note. So I will instead point out something fun from this episode. A couple of times, Apolli refers to this operation as playing whack-a-mole. At least that's the way it's translated. I looked it up. He is actually saying whack-a-mole. He is saying Mogura Tataki, which is the Japanese name for the whack-a-mole arcade game, which was first introduced in 1975. And it's literally mole striking. He really was one of the only crew members who was any fun. And now our research on The Gate of Zidane. Since its first mention in the series, we have pondered and poked at the name The Gate of Zidane. After all, it's not a gate in any literal sense, and doesn't look like any gate I've ever seen. And initially, Zidane wasn't any help in our search either. Then Tom had a breakthrough. <laughs> I should mention that the question of what the Gate of Zidane is supposed to be referencing is something that has actually been dogging the Gundam fandom for a while. It could just be a random collection of syllables that sound kind of good together, but calling it the Gate of Zidane rather than just Zidane makes it sound like a reference to something. And additionally, we know that Abawaku was a reference, Solomon was a reference, Luna 2 is kind of a reference. Like, the names of these space fortresses tend to be references to real-world things. Having exhausted the English side of the fandom, I started looking in Japanese, and of what I was able to find, I did discover an intriguing theory. Now, we do know, based on some official profiles that were published, that Jemitov Hyman was born in the France region of Earth. And as I was searching, I found a bunch of Japanese fans theorizing that the name Zedan comes from the Sedan region of France, that Hyman named the Gate of Zedan after this part of France. And a lot of these theories also supposed that Hyman himself was born in the Sedan region. That I wasn't able to find a source for. But I don't think it's necessary. I think just knowing that he is from France and knowing the importance of Sedan was enough to make us zero in on that particular region. 
And with that starting point, Nina was able to find some very interesting information. So Sedan is actually a town located in northeastern France, just 10 kilometers or about six miles south of the border with Belgium. Founded in 1424, it was a refuge for Protestants fleeing France during the wars of religion in the 1500s and was part of a sovereign principality until 1651. The town's castle, the Chateau de Sedan, has the claim to fame of being the largest fortress in Europe, covering an area of 35,000 square meters or 380,000 square feet across seven levels. Wow. What began as a manor house with two towers built around a church gradually expanded. A circular boulevard and terraces lined with cannon were built. The curtain wall was thickened from four and a half meters to 30, or from 15 feet to 90, and bastions were added. Once the castle became part of France, the castle was converted into a garrison, and in 1822, the church was demolished and replaced with storage for cannonballs. Vauban, the famous French military engineer, designed and built some of the fortifications, including the Door of Princes, which was specifically built for the movement of artillery pieces. He is not particularly relevant to today's research and discussion, but Vauban is a fascinating character if you find you want to do a little extracurricular research on your own. <laughs> the chateau was also the birthplace of Henri de la Tour de Auvergne, pardon my pronunciation, Viscount of Touraine, often just shortened to Touraine, considered to be one of the greatest generals in modern history, hmm. which m might be why they theorized that Hymen was born there, if they think there's a, a comparison or a parallel being drawn to Turenne. Also, his career began in the 1620s, so, you know, modern. There are three famous battles called the Battle of Sedan, a fact that in itself feels significant as the Gate of Zedan slash Abawaku has been the site of several pivotal battles at this point, in the One Year War and now in whatever this war will be called once enough time has elapsed. Should I tell you or... Nah, probably not. The battle in 1641 is also called the Battle of La Marfe and was part of the Franco-Spanish War, which was connected to the Thirty Years' War. But the details of this battle make no mention of any of Zidane's gates and don't seem to have a connection to the events of Zeta Gundam, except for the fact that the political situation in Europe at that time was dominated by three factions. The Titans, Aeug, and Axis. I mean, <laughs> the Bourbons, the Habsburgs, and the Holy Roman Empire. That order doesn't mean anything, by the way. I didn't think that out. Right this moment, it's not particularly relevant which of our three factions is which, but who knows? Maybe it will be later. There was a Battle of Sedan during the Second World War, and given the many World War II parallels and influences we've seen throughout Gundam so far, this seemed like a promising lead. The Battle of Sedan was part of the Battle of France and took place across several days in May of 1940. The area around Sedan is the Ardennes, a hilly and thickly forested region that the French considered impassable by tanks, a natural fortification. A fact that military exercises just two years before had disproven but this had been covered up to prevent negative effects on morale. In essence, the military knew that Sedan and the northern border defenses were insufficient, but a lack of resources, lack of will, and bad weather slowed efforts to strengthen the fortifications until it was too late. German forces were able to capture Sedan more or less without resistance, using it as a jumping off point to control the river crossings, make their way to the English Channel, and pour forces across the river and into France. After the Luftwaffe spent an entire day in rolling bombing of Sedan, the Panzer Corps rolled in to find no sign of French troops, who had fallen back to nearby high ground on the Marfe Ridge. The next day, the attack focused on several nearby bridgeheads. The German artillery were outnumbered by the French and depended on air support to act as flying artillery. The air bombardment was the heaviest ever seen in the world to date, and wound up being the heaviest of the entire war. Two dive bomber wings flew 300 sorties, and nine bomber wing units flew almost 4,000 over a period of only eight hours. To cut off movement and communication, 
fighters targeted landlines and radio antennae. As you can imagine hearing that description, the greatest damage was psychological. A French counterattack, as well as attempts to destroy or recapture the bridges, failed. The Germans were able to encircle the strongest Allied armies, including the British Expeditionary Force, and subsequent battles in June of 1940 destroyed the remaining fighting capacity of the French army and expelled the British from France. The whole thing happened so quickly, there were very few casualties on either side. Military historians agree that this battle sealed France's fate. It is certainly one of those where you read about it and can't help but wonder, what if? And I definitely recommend reading more about it. The Wikipedia page is very detailed and heavily sourced and will be linked in the show notes. Yet this is another battle of Sedan where the gate didn't seem to have any particular significance, and I still hoped for a clearer connection to Zeta. Enter the Battle of Sedan, 1870 edition, part of the Franco-Prussian War. This one, also very significant. Although fighting continued for a while afterward, this battle ended in the capture of Napoleon III and a huge number of French troops, effectively deciding the war in favor of Prussia and its allies. Napoleon III, who was the Emperor of France at the time. This battle was on September 1st and 2nd, 1870. Paris was besieged by September 19th. The French army, led by Napoleon III and accompanied by General Macmahon, was trying to lift the siege at Metz and instead was pushed back and surrounded at Sedan. Things hadn't exactly been going well for them beforehand. They had been defeated in the Battle of Gravelotte on August 18th, the largest of the war. The army they were trying to free had been besieged at Metz since August 19th. After the failure to lift the siege, the army fell back to Sedan, but this was only meant to be temporary. A chance to rest the troops, who had been on a long series of marches, to resupply, and to gain some room to maneuver. As seems to be a pattern, Macmahon underestimated the strength of the opposing force and assumed that the terrain would offer a defensive advantage. As would happen again in World War II, non-stop bombardment, although this time from artillery, was the key to the German victory. The Prussian general, Helmut von Molke, said of the situation, now we have them in the mousetrap. French forces could not break through, could not escape, I could not do anything about the constant artillery barrage. Napoleon ordered a white flag run up on the fortress walls and surrendered to the Prussian royal headquarters. Napoleon's capture led to the collapse of the Second French Empire and a bloodless revolution, as his government was replaced by a government of national defense, the first government of the Third French Republic. The war would continue for five more months, but with one army trapped at Metz, an entire other army captured, there were a total of 104,000 French POWs from the Battle of Sedan. Whew. And Paris besieged, there was no chance of a French victory. There is a story about the French armies in the Franco-Prussian War, <laughs> no one knows if it's true, uh, that they marched off to war so confident in their inevitable victory that they brought with them maps of Germany, but no maps of France. I said German with air quotes earlier because Germany, as we understand it, did not exist at that time. In fact, Prussia's victory over France played a key role in German unification, which was finalized in 1871 when the princes of most of the German states proclaimed William I of Prussia German Emperor. The Battle of Sedan was widely recognized as a pivotal moment in the unification of Germany, so much so that an unofficial holiday, Sedantag, celebrated the victory. While it was never made official and participation and support varied over time and among different groups, it was celebrated until 1919, when the Minister for the Interior of the Weimar Republic put an end to it. We still have a sticking point. The gate! <laughs> Here is where an unexpected source provided a likely answer. The source is a book titled Images at War, Illustrated Periodicals and Constructed Nations by Michel Martin. And this book analyzes how illustrated periodicals created and reinforced concepts of national identity, beginning with the Franco-Prussian War. In covering the surrender, Martin describes two different engravings. Both depict the raising of the white flag of surrender from the most prominent of Sedan's gates. 
These depictions use the gate as a symbol of attitudes about the surrender or of the surrender itself. In one engraving, the gate is depicted as outsized, massive, and the figure tiny, almost indistinguishable, standing atop it, mocking the surrender. It makes Napoleon seem small, insignificant, the surrender cowardly. The other engraving, in which the figure holding the flag of surrender is the main figure of the image, with the gate that he is standing on mostly out of frame, the figure bears a suspicious resemblance to Napoleon III himself. This one appeared on the front page of a London paper and seems to take a certain glee in France and Napoleon's troubles. What is significant is not the art itself, but that the gate served as a visual shorthand for the surrender. Assuming that the Titans are the ones who renamed Abawaku the Gate of Zedan, they presumably see themselves as the Prussians in this scenario, and this as the site of their enemy's humiliating defeat. It just turns out they were actually the French. Irony. And the faction called Axis, then, would represent the Germans? Yes. As how, Tom, how unexpected. <laughs> as Tom pointed out, the aesthetics of Zeta harken back to this time more than they do to the 20th century. So while it's not a slam dunk, this seems like a pretty clear connection to me. And if Axis is Prussia, that makes Minerva the Kaiser, and Haman would be a... Uh, Otto von Bismarck? Give, give Otto von Bismarck a cubelet. If this parallel bears out through the rest of Zeta, the victory of the Aug Axis alliance in this episode may well seal Aug's fate. Remember I mentioned the unification of Germany. Well, until now, there's been very little unity among space noids. Different sides represent their own factions with different governing bodies and different political concerns. Plus what I might call interest groups, like AUG, based on ideological issues rather than spatial proximity. But just as the victory at Sedan helped Prussia solidify control and become leader of the German principalities, we can see that the victory puts Axis not just in a position to secure territory and sovereignty, but to angle for leadership of all space noids. This is perhaps what Haman was getting at when she said, I can only restore the Zavi family with your death, when she's talking to Hymen. His consent to her restoring the Zavi family, even his aid, is not actually enough. She needs a great symbolic victory that will bring all the space noids willingly rallying to her banners. So Apoli Bay passes violently into the next world. His last act, a last minute rescue of Camille and Fa. His death marks a turning point in Zeta, for Apoli had become the odd man out among the surviving pilots. He was the last ordinary man still dancing with the gods and demons that now rule the battlefield. When Camille graduated to the Zeta and Emma went from Arictias to the Mark II before upgrading to the Super Gundam, when Fa claimed the Methos, Rekua took the Palace Athene, and Sarah the Bolinok Saman, and most of all when Quattro traded his pretense of humble obscurity for the flashiest mobile suit available, Apoli kept flying his Rictias. Its obsolescence mirrored his own but he would never let that stop him. He never stood out like the young new types. He never had as much to do or to say as Emma or Bright, but he was always there in the background, a comforting presence, an emotional bulwark who offered the children who flew with him some vital perspective. He was there to comfort Camille through the difficult early days, acting as the older brotherly sort of mentor that by all rights, Quattro ought to have been, had he even the slightest notion how. And Apoli always kept an eye on Fa. He never tried to hold her back the way others did. He let her fly, but you could tell he was worried about her. He did what he could to help her adjust to the rigors of military life. 
and he died in a most Appley Bay kind of way, doing his best to protect Camille and Fa. Will his name be famous? In 1747, in our world, the samurai Kichiemon passed away. But Kichiemon was not some obscure retainer making his peace at the end of an unspectacular life. He was one of the 47 ronin whose story is told in the famous tale Chushingura. Those 47 ronin have gone down in legend for the extreme lengths that they went to in order to avenge the death of their lord and the way that they, all together, died after completing their mission so that they could at last follow their lord into the next world. Except that the most junior of the lot, the 47th, was denied the honor of participating in the Vendetta's final act. There were duties left for him. He was ordered to live on, publicize the group's actions to take care of the families of the deceased. This he did faithfully for more than 40 years before a natural death claimed him. Before he died, he wrote this death poem. Sakutoki wa hana no kazu ni wa hairane domo chiru ni wa onaji yamazakura. In bloom among the flowers I hardly counted. But in falling, all flowers are equal. Kichiemon outlived his more famous companions, and Apoli predeceased his, but both of them had a kind of quiet, humble honor, one that was more useful to the living than the dead. So he dies, like Roberto before him. The kids who looked up to him mourn, and in mourning they need him more than ever. His absence stings all the harder when we realize that there is now no one left to fill his role. They have no emotional mooring post. They are cast adrift with only each other to cling on to. And on the bridge, Char and Bright sit quietly, each with their own thoughts. Next time on episode 2.47, A Battle Among Gods. We cover Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam episode 46 and The O. Tension in the Harem. Char gets visitation rights. Cat's Master Strategist. You're asking a lot of questions already answered by my asking for help. The Passive Voice. I don't have to listen to you. You don't even have a name. Lala number four? Boring. You can't murder in here. This is the war room. And famous last words. You will see the tears of time. Remember to do all of the podcast things. Subscribe and review Mobile Suit Breakdown wherever you get your podcasts. Then pledge your undying devotion to Mobile Suit Breakdown on Patreon, where you can find great bonus content, get access to the MSB Discord, get exclusive MSB merchandise, and, you know, support the podcast. You can also follow at Gundam Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, and like us at facebook.com slash Gundam Podcast for all kinds of extra content. And you should always check out our website, GundamPodcast.com, for all of our episodes, show notes, watch list, wish list, some other lists, and more. Plus, you can always email your questions, comments, and complaints to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. 
Or share your wrong Gundam opinion with the world by shouting, Katz is just doing very normal courtship stuff, like spying on your girlfriend while she's in jail, and then shooting around her when she escapes. Out your window at passersby. We might not hear you, but you'll be helping us all stay safe. The TNN this week includes Prayers by Admiral Bob and One of Them by Kevin MacLeod. And the tribute to Lieutenant Appley includes Blue Feather by Kevin MacLeod. The intro song is Wasp by Misha Dioxin. And the closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. You can find links and more in the show notes. And thank you for listening. In the future, I think it would be helpful for me if, when you have a good opener, you give me some hint as to what that opener is or is about. I think Sarah would make fun of me for drinking my shots in an unmanly way. That's why she'll never love me. And he punched her in the stomach. I think he punched her in the face. Oh no, that's right. <laughs> I'm gonna cut that. <laughs> um. All right, I think it's time. Is it? I'm sure we can talk about other stuff. I also wondered if there wasn't a production reason for this. Like, is Rosamia's voice actor unavailable? I think it's narrative. I keep wanting to say advocate when I mean abdicate. It's the sleepy time of the afternoon. What's the star and Rekua forces us once again to discuss? Oh, um, I thought of that uh, pun mm. about GND3R. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to remember it for, oh, uh, yeah, exactly, when I do the social media posts. And then there's supposed to be a beep, apparently. Yeah, because you're, you're doing the rating. Oh, yeah. No wrong Gundam opinion yet? Not yet. Okay. Uh. Trying to look at the IPA French yeah. symbols because um, I think I remember someone telling me it's McMahon, McMahon, or MacMahon. Even though it's French. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it's MacMon. Mon. Wow, the search on this is terrible. MacMon. MacMon. I hate this. I hate it a lot. I am ready to be done with work today.